at the archivist at the, and I'm gonna, no, I'm going to mispronounce it, Wawrunga site, is that close? <laughs> of the South Pacific Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She also serves as curator at the Adventist Heritage Center and South Sea Islands Museum, which is part of Avondale College, and I won't slaughter the name of the town in New South Wales, Australia. <laughs> Just be with me until I get this up. Somebody in IT. Somebody in IT, can you help me? actually about 18 months ago, I was actually holding three positions. Uh, fortunately, one of those, uh, the top one, has disappeared. Um, I actually worked in Avondale College of Higher Education for over 30 years, um, while I was also asked to take up as curator of the Adventist Heritage Centre. I hated history, <laughs> I have to tell you, um, and um, I thought they're mad. And then I fell in love with it, and uh, I love the fact that I'm now a curator. And then uh, once I was a curator, they turned around and said, well, um, the person at uh, the South Pacific Division is retiring. Could you do that as well? So currently I work two days at the South Pacific Division in Wurunga in Sydney, and the other two and a half days I work in Kurunbong uh, at the Adventist Heritage Centre and South Sea Islands Museum. So it's just giving you a little bit of background. Oops. Okay, looking at approaches to preservation. We've got a choice. Do nothing and keep as it arrives. There is some thinking out there that uh, we it's really changing in the field, and that is that uh, you restore things back to their, you know, pristine condition. That is changing, at least in Australia, that is changing now, uh, particularly in museums, that as the item arrives, you may clean it, but you don't attempt to bring it back to its original. So it's got dints in it or tears or anything like that. You leave it as such. The main thing is to minimise any further, further damage. Format shifting, I'll come back to talking about that. You can restore the item to look like new. That's kind of going out of fashion. Options one to three are actually very economical. 
The fourth one is the very expensive one. So, what's valuable or what's worthless? If you're setting up an archives or you have one, really the most important thing to start off with is your archives policy. Make a decision about what, you know, have an, have an acquisition statement. Decide what you are going to have in that archives. Otherwise, it will just grow and nobody really knows what's in the collection and why you're even collecting it. Also have an access policy. Um, if you are anything like me, I do have materials in the collection that are highly confidential or are very controversial. And you really do need to have an access policy that restricts uh, the use of that material we have some things in the eyes, in the collection that will not be open for 50 years because of the nature of that material. And everybody needs to know that what that access policy is and that you will not budge from it. And that applies to all your staff if you've got volunteers as well. In your archives policy you should also have procedures for acquiring, organising, handling, reformatting and storing items. Um, this particularly becomes important and it's something I had to learn um, coming from a library background, coming into archives, I really had to do a, a total mind shift um, because in the library, you know, if something gets damaged, well you throw it, you know, you replace it with a new item. Um, or you get rid of it, you know, it's no longer of use in archives. Um, it doesn't matter how tattered the item is. It could be highly important. Um, it may be an old Bible with a, somebody, you know, like the Miller Bible. Um, you, you're not going to throw it out just because it looks old. Um, so you need to know how and have procedures for that material coming in as to how you're going to handle it. Also, you need to have something on learning and copying and publishing, um, all, to, all really tied up with copyright, also tied up with uh, your donation policy. Um, you do have people who will come in and say, look, um, I want to be contacted if anybody wants access to this material. And it may be private letters, for instance. Um, you may have items that are actually only on loan for, to you for a period of time. You're not actually getting them permanently. So you need to have um, some sort of policy there as well. And you also need to have a policy for refusing records and disposal schedule. I always, when uh, anybody donates something, they're actually signing over the rights uh, so that I have copyright um, I can reproduce that, uh, you know, if it's photos, they're actually handing that copyright over to me, uh, or over to the institution, I should say. Um, it's also, we only keep one of anything, we can't house more than that, unless it's a, you know, has signi uh, some other significance, you know, it might have um, notes written in the, you know, margins or something by a significant person, then in that case we would have two. Uh, but generally we only keep one copy of anything. So I need to know that when somebody actually um, passes something on to us, that I can actually dispose of it when I choose to dispose of it, uh, not as they may want. Um, I also have had donors who said, well look, if you don't want it, uh, can we have it back again? So you need to have that right up front and and have that in your um, donation or you know loan policy, um, so that it's actually sitting there. With all your forms, yeah, you do need to get those in place very early on. It's going to save you a lot of headaches. When I came into um, the archives, there were no forms whatsoever, and one of the problems I faced was that we had um, fairly significant. Um, donation, but nobody had actually given these people a form design to say that they'd actually formally, you know, given it to us. 
Um, and that was a sanctuary model, including the high chief's um, you know, uniform, or whatever you like to call it, clothing. And um, the family turned up and said, well, you know, we thought that um, when we gave it to you many years ago, before my time, that it would be on permanent display and we're not happy, we want it back. Well, I had no grounds for saying no, um, because it had never actually been signed over to us. Uh, as, and that donation form or the loan form becomes a legal document. So try and get that in place very early on because otherwise you are going to lose very good resources uh, if a relative of the family down the track says, oh, my great-grandfather gave you such and such, I want it back. Um, and they can fight you for it and they will get it back and you'll lose it. Okay, an acquisitions policy may look like something like this. Um, you can easily find them on the web if you don't know how to write one, then please just jump on the web. Um, most universities, most archives, state archives, um, national archives, all will have uh, an acquisitions policy. For those who are in libraries, you've probably got an acquisitions policy, so it's just a matter of write, rewriting it. Okay, appraisal. When an item comes in, how do you decide what is enduring value? So you've got financial records. Again, look, you will need to look at the legislation in the state in which you are working or the country in which you're working. I deal with several countries and I've discovered their um, policies on how long you are required to keep financial records all varies from country to country. Um, but you need to know that. So you need to know if you're keeping financial records, which ones you have to keep permanently and which ones you may only need to keep for three years, one year, seven years. It all varies. Audit reports are another one. They vary. Final budgets or you know the main, main um, annual budgets or whatever. That can be another, um, you know, they, they all vary. Uh, financial reports, expenditure and income, minutes. Um, again, look at creating a retention and disposal schedule. That retention and disposal schedule basically is a list of items how long you keep it for, where you keep it, and when you dispose of it. It's well, it's a lot of work. You will find most universities have got them, um, and the larger archives will actually have them, so you can go and look at them. Um, I've found that I can even, if you talk to some of these institutions, they'll actually say, yeah, look, fine, use it. Uh, don't worry about copyright. We're happy for you to have it. Now, can we send you a copy of ours? Uh, others will say, mm, no, create your own. So you will need to look at that. Administrative records, um, policy files, statements of function, organisational charts, name-based records, staff listings, um, PSRs, public, um, personal service records, minutes of meetings, annual reports, building plans, regulations, they're all things that you may well have to keep permanently. Procedures is another one that you may be looking at. Legal records, that would be contracts, leases, significant agreements, uh, etc. that you may be needing to actually keep permanently. Uh, state records, this is of, uh, in Australia, um, you'll find most of this stuff is actually available online. You don't have to try and create it. Go looking at your government bodies. Um, they will have that information readily available up there. Here's an example of a, um, a retention and disposal schedule. Um, I, I did actually ask um, GC for a retention and disposal schedule um, and got it back. And I have to admit, I went 
are you sure you sent me the right thing? Because in Australia, the retention disposal schedule run, can run into hundreds of pages. Um, so you need to put in as much detail as is appropriate for you. We tend to go uh, very, very detailed so that for instance, under accounting, we will actually say accounts payable. So we know exactly what we're talking about. Uh, we'll talk about journals. You know, we'll actually spell out every type of document that fits into that category, rather than just saying accounting um, documents. We'll actually go into great detail. So. The next one is personal records. Diaries, letters, postcards, again, of permanent value, particularly if they're written by uh, or have been used by significant persons. Photographs, films, etc., again, enduring. Artworks and artefacts, uh, particularly if they relate to your institution, but again, your accession policy will guide you uh, with that. Books with significant author signatures are a must. So if you've got a choice between a pristine copy and a copy that actually has the author's signature in it, try and go for the one with the author's signature in it. Much more valuable. Sermon notes. Um, we, we collect basically whatever sermon notes we can get our hands on. Um, from those who have worked in our division. So we wouldn't pick up the sermon notes for USA, for instance. We're not interested in those. But if they've, um, if for instance, a, an American comes out and preaches in Australia and we get those notes, then we can potentially keep those. Again, refer to your acquisition policy or your acquisition statement. If you're trying to um, look at what else has happened in your state, then by all means, jump online, have a look at your local university, <coughs> public university. I know in Australia, I, every public university basically has um, some details about what they actually do, so you can then take it and adapt it for yourself. Um, I must admit I haven't really looked over here. Church records. Um, we collect some significant church programs, photographs, artworks, artefacts, minute books, registers, certificates, newspaper cuttings, again, that relate to the church within the division, because we collect for the whole division, not just for a very small area, you know, maybe just your local area. Um, we actually have to collect for the whole division. Um, journals, pamphlets, books that are both written about the area and also published within the area um, within that division, again driven by the acquisition statement and also by your retention and disposal schedule. So those two actually work hand in hand. Okay. Again, look online. You will actually find often uh, the religious organisations will have um, already collection policies, acquisition policies. Um, you can get some guidance from those as well, I've found. And above all, abide by GC rules. They do have a standard that they expect of all institutions um, to be keeping some things. So you need to meet those as well as those of the institution in which you're working, as well as those of the state or the area, in, you know, geographical area that you're working in. So there's a number of layers there that you actually need to be um, keeping in mind when you're doing it. Uh, GC1. Okay, refusing and discarding records. Reasons could be um, involves minor administrative matters, 
does not meet your acquisition policy, not suitable for your archives, you know, poor physical um, collection. I've had boxes turn up that have been infested by rats. Um, we do actually go through them uh, and pick out what we think we need to keep. And I have actually kept books that have got holes right through them because that is the only item. You know, we have never ever seen another one. Um, so we've actually kept it, cleaned it up, and actually kept it. Um, difficult uh, electronic format, um, too costly to keep or a duplicate. They can all be reasons for why you may discard. But again, go back to your archives acquisitions policy, your retention disposal schedule, and your donation form. Make sure you're abiding by all of those. So your donation form, if you're looking to write one, header, who is it, who you are, spaces for the donor, description of the items being given, make sure you've got copyright transfer in it. Uh, make sure you've also got something like I declare that, you know, they are the actual owner of the item. They haven't stolen it from someone and given it to you. Um, and that they are actually giving it a free will as well. Um, that's kind of important. Internal procedures, you may want to you know, make sure that you actually know who has received it, or when it was uh, received, um, who has then said, it, is it actually going to go into the collection? Um, and if there's to be acknowledgements, then make sure you actually include acknowledgements as well. Um, there's an example of ours, the current one. We do update it from time to time. Um, we do actually ask if they want a nameplate put in the item, uh, in the catalogue as well. Uh, some people do want that. I find the majority don't. They'd rather just give you the item and that's it. Um, they don't need to have their name put anywhere. We also have an agreement with Andrews University whereby if we have, um, we have a system. If uh, we already have the item, then our, I look at that and say, okay, who else might benefit from this item? So we look at it, Andrews University for Australia or South Pacific um, material, such as documents and so forth. Um, we look at the, um, Avondale College Libraries, if they need to, other libraries within our division. Um, we look at the E.G. White Research Centre and we go through all of those and then basically get down to the end where we say, well, okay, look, we'll, we'll give it away to the students if they want it or we'll actually throw it in the bin. But rather than just getting rid of an item, um, there is possible possibly somewhere else in the world who would die to have that item. And I found that in majority of cases, most of the stuff that I get uh, as duplicates actually ends up in another collection somewhere. Um, Andrews is responsible for collecting for the whole world. So the arrangement that I've got at the moment is that um, we wait until we've got a crate um, full, it's about uh, 57 boxes, I think it is, goes on a crate, and then we ship that off uh, every couple of years to Andrews. Um, and I'm uh, hoping to get to Andrews while I'm over here to actually learn what they do with it because <laughs> I'm hoping it's put to good use. <laughs> Format shifting. Uh, this is a really controversial, and I know we've been talking this morning about it. Um, in Australia, it is a really, a really big issue about format. Okay, legally, some documents or some records must be kept in the original format. You can make a copy, but the original must be kept. I so often need from administrators say, oh, let's digitise everything and then you're not going to have a storage problem. Because their idea is you digitise and you throw. Uh, it's an ongoing one I have. Um, and then I remind them, I said, well, in that case, can I digitise all the minutes and get rid of them? 
and they go, oh, no, I can't do that. And so you have to sometimes remind people why you actually keep the original. One of the difficulties that I've faced is that uh, people would say, oh, you've got to digitise everything. And I'll say, yeah, look, you know, I could have started digitising 10 years ago, um, but the format I digitised back then, would you be able to look at it now? if we didn't format shift along the way and they go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, was the scanner five years ago, you know, as good as today's scanner? Um, so there's things like that that uh, you need to assess. You know, can you support whatever format you do it into in one, two, five, ten years time? Um, one of the problems I've found with IT is that when I started to say, look, I, I really want to digitise all our photos, and they go, yeah, and how much room is that going to take? Uh, and when I come back with a, you know, an estimated figure, they go, uh-uh, no, we haven't got the room to do it, um, no, you can't do it. So that is a, you know, I'm excited about this project in the fact that we may be able to digitise our photos and send them here, <laughs> get them stored, and, you know, where I can't in my location. We just don't have that capability. Um, appropriate storage conditions is critical to this. Um, copyright is also, I see, a, another big issue because if you haven't had that copyright signed over to you, then you really don't have a right to um, reproduce it and put it somewhere else. Um, as for us at the moment, we keep what we can in original format, including the reformatted version. Um, digital photographs we store on a dedicated hard drive with a dedicated backup. Um, we've been forced this way because of IT. Um, but you need to look at your individual situations. You may, may be lucky to have a much better situation. It's a very large subject, and everyone has their own opinion about it. That's my experience with it. OK, physical storage. Main thing about physical storing or preserving items is about buffers and protection. So you have a choice. Um, in the bottom photo, what you're seeing there, in fact, is rolled tarpa cloth or woven mats. And we actually roll them in um, cotton cloth. Uh, and then we put, we actually put them, we wrap a uh, PVC pipe in mylar first. So, and then we roll uh, cotton onto that then intersperse between the mat um, cotton cloth as well so there's no um, dye coming across from the two layers of mats and then eventually roll the whole thing with an outer layer. Um, big gel and then we put it on long rods so it's not resting on anything, it's totally supported. Uh, the main thing really is to give a individual environment to each item. So if you've got documents, put them into a box. That cre creates a mini environment and we'll buffer it from the extreme temperatures and humidity and so forth outside of that. We always use acid-free boxes and we make sure all polypropylene boxes. Um, there are archive boxes out there on the market called archive boxes, but they are not as free. And the other thing I've learned is, um, and this was an experience that in the Adventist Heritage Centre, we started the reboxing process. Um, we kept all our things into easy hand, you know, take about two reams of paper. When I was asked to go to SPD, they had boxes this large and they stacked them to the roof, which basically meant even for the men who had to climb a ladder and get the box and then climb back down the ladder, we had back injuries. 
So we're in the process now, because of OHS issues, of actually having to rebox all those down to smaller boxes, which basically can be picked up and put under your arm, uh, and not too heavy. Um, I mainly have girls working with me. I do have uh, some volunteers that are guys, but mainly girls and often um, students. So therefore, you've got to have them at a weight that, you know, you're not going to injure anybody. Boxes, they, if you check, you'll find there are archive companies around. Um, they'll come in standard sizes, or in the case, we actually make a lot of our own now because we can't buy them. Um, and the, you can get um, cardboard that's been buffered, it has an outer layer on it, so it, it is in essence acid free. Um, and there's very there's corrugated blue grey ones that I've seen. There's galvan um, galvan board um, has metal on the ends of it. They're tending to be phased out in Australia because they go rusty. Uh, and also you can injure yourself on them. That's the other one we've had a number of cuts from those. Polypropylene um, is really the only f um, type of plastic that's existable. Um, acceptable because it doesn't outgas at all. We use um, all these types of boxes for documents, LPs, videos, basically everything. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes. You, you can buy the grey card, the acid-free card, and actually make your own with a hot glue gun. Um, and we have to do that because of a lot of our music and artifacts. Um, Etherfoam, it's a it's like ordinary foam rubber but it's a special type of foam quite hard um, and you can carve it and therefore very delicate items can be sat into it such as like this um, we've got some um, indigenous items uh, so they can be you know very well supported archival folders Ordinary manual folders, office folders are not acceptable. You need to be looking at getting acid-free ones. We use those for filing. Um, document wallets are another possibility. Um, they're a bit like a folder and closed folder, so if you've got small things, they don't fall out if somebody, you know, um, up into the folder. There's also archival envelopes that you can get as well. There's two types of tissues on the market, um, unbuffeted and buffeted. The unbuffeted uh, generally is used for wrapping objects, and textiles, um, silk and wool, supporting clothing, baskets, etc. The buffeted um, is for wrapping and interweaving in paper-based materials. Uh, you need to probably keep in mind that there are two different types there and use them appropriately. Um, what the other thing that does happen with these over, over time is that they will become acid. You know, if you're wrapping something that is very acid prone and outgassing with acid, uh, they will take on that and you may have to re wrap over a number of years. So it's not like a permanent thing when you're using tissue paper. Um, Tivac, uh, I don't know whether you get that here. We have it in, you do have it. Uh, again, it's a, it's a lack of cloth, um, brilliant for wrapping um, things that have got sort of sharp edges on them, is what we tend to use it for. We use it particularly for baskets. We do use it for um, wrapping um, some of our mats, more delicate mats. But if look, if you can't afford it, just use cotton cloth. Make sure you wash the cotton cloth and you rinse it very, very well so you don't have any sizing left in the cloth or any uh, chemicals left in the cloth. But uh, we use a lot of that because we can't afford the other more standard type thing. Myla is uh, basically a polypropylene plastic. Uh, it's a clear plastic, um, doesn't outgas, brilliant for um, supporting things and also for wrapping items as well. Uh, again, it comes in several weights. 
So look at the weight as to why you would be using it for a particular item. You know, if you're trying to hold, say, the pages open on a book, then you'd probably use a very lightweight one because uh, you don't. It's much easier to you know wrap around. Whereas the heavyweight one, you literally got to put creases in it um, to actually you can make a box out of it. It's so heavy. Polyethylene, there is a special type of bubble wrap out there for archiving. Don't use ordinary um, bubble wrap. There is a special type out there. Um, I generally buy this stuff by the roll and just use it over multiple years. Uh, if you can't do that, then use cotton cloth, um, preferably with no dyes in it. In regard to transporting, one of the things I just saw recently, I was at the Powerhouse Museum, a very well-known museum in Sydney, and what they did for transporting, which I thought was quite neat, they just used big plastic buckets, and they made um, small pillows, which were basically cotton cloth around, like they are made like bean bags, if you know what bean bags are. And so they'd made small versions of these bean bags and had them in several sizes. And so that was their quick way of being able to transport stuff around safely because uh, you could shape them, you know, so, but you wouldn't store them in that necessarily uh, unless it's something that is not going to be affected by acid because the beans were just ordinary, um, you know, beans that you can't buy them as acid free. So, um, but if, you know, if you were pushed, I guess you, you know, you'd find a way around it. Um, photographs, okay, we, be, we began uh, with our photograph collection. We had thousands of these things. And so I said, look, well, let's just sort them first in a, you know, in a broad subject. So uh, we put them into envelopes. We separated the colour from the black and white because of um, chemically they are different. So you need to keep your colour and your black and white separate. We then moved from there to actual folders. And now we've actually moved one step further and we're creating albums um, with sleeves that like ring binders, but they're an archival quality. So the photographs now are in um, actual albums as sleeves, we can choose the size of the sleeve that we put in that fits the particular photos. Um, we get them in two different sizes. We can get them in fills cap or what we call A4. I guess the equivalent for many of you would be quarto. Um, so you can get them in two. Always keep in mind that when you're handling photographs, wear either cotton glass or some other form of glass. The reason for that is that the oil will come off your hands and over time you will actually destroy your photographs. So, you know, with your gloves, when they get dirty, cotton gloves, I simply wash them and rinse them twice. So I've got no residue of any of the, you know, washing powder left um, on them. And it's the the advantage I found in going into the photo albums, and these are polypropylene, so they're archive quality, is that I can give them out to people to look at um, and they don't get damaged any further because they're in a sleeve, they're protected, people can look at them without you know, actually physically having to handle every photo. They come in multiple... Um, at least we find them, we can get them in multiple um, sizes, uh, you can get them for film strips, you can get them for just about every size photo that you want, right up to um, A1, um, so you can get quite large in that, you can actually put in posters into them as well. Artworks, one of the most effective methods we found, and this was something we learned from another institution, is we put up a wire, and it was a cheap way of doing it, but it worked really well for us. We just put a wire grid up on a wall, covered the whole wall in this wire grid, and then allowed us to actually hang our artwork there. 
So instead of taking up a huge amount of floor space, it literally was only taking up you know, just a little bit of wall space. Um, didn't mean, of course, that we hung the ones that we thought we would never use right at the top um, because we didn't want to have to get them down again. But it's a cheap way of getting around that. The other alternative is to go to plain cabinets, uh, Mylar sleeves or um, as free cardboard folders that you can get. Uh, if they're small enough, you can box them. Alternatively, you could roll them. Uh, to, again, depending on what it is. Okay, preservation problems. Poor storage and dust are probably the worst things possible. Building challenges, I've had those um, originally when we moved into our current facilities. Uh, the air conditioning also belonged to the library. And the library only ran their air conditioning uh, during opening hours. So outside of that, the humidity went you know, from 40 up to 99% which meant we had mould problems, no end. So the only thing that we could do was to cut off the air conditioning and put our own system in. Uh, as soon as we did that, we got our humidity down, we could run it 24 hours, and so we had constant um, humidity and temperature, and we alleviated our mould problem totally. Mould outbreaks are... are a pain uh, and it's something you need to be aware that as soon as you see mold treat it do not say oh, I'll leave that for a month because the reality is if you've got mold on a book on a shelf and you walk past it you have just spread that mold right down the whole row of shelves it spreads that easily um, so <laughs> um, vermin attacks is another problem. We put in what we call sticky baits. Um, they're basically um, what we put in is what we call sticky baits. They're like a piece of cardboard with a sticky surface on them and we, cha we keep a very close eye on those. We sit them near our doorways because that's usually where most things enter. Um, and it's good if you can pick them up. If, if you get a donation in and you realise that it's got something in it, put it in a plastic bag immediately. That is your first thing to do with that. Uh, water leaks is a, can be a problem from air conditioners or you know, simply the building. Um, light exposure, we had a major problem with that in the museum, so we actually, when they built the museum, they didn't understand about light exposure to objects. So we found the cheapest way was to actually go out and buy a, um, a film that we could put over, a UV film, um, and we just simply put pins in it and tacked it over the windows just to reduce our UV um, coming in. Still gave us light in the, in the building, but at least um, reduced our UV issues. Old adhesives uh, come apart. Um, whatever you do, please do not use ordinary tape for sticking things together. That's an absolute no. You've probably seen it. It goes brown, peels off, leaves a residue, leaves a mark on the item. Don't, it, it's better to put something that is damaged into, say, a Mylar sleeve, uh, rather than actually try and repair it. Um, if you're going to repair it, then please go and learn how to do the repairs correctly with the correct things. And most of the state libraries or national libraries will run pro do run programs for that, uh, and will teach you. Or go and go to a you know a local archives and actually learn how to do those. It is vastly different to how you repair library books. It was one thing I had to basically say. Okay, yeah, I know how to repair library books. I've done it for years, but how I repair an archive item. 
is totally different to that. I use totally different methods, totally different materials. Um, you don't use, you know, book binding tape. Um, that's, you know, <laughs> that's an out. Um, electrical interference, uh, particularly if you've got um, any sort of disks in the collection, you know, computer disks or whatever, that can be a problem. Staples, anything with metal in it will go rusty over time, so when an item comes in, try and remove it if you can. Um, cataloging. Um, my experience has been um, you have catalogues who love cataloging um, difficult things and you have other catalogers who don't. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's the real that's my been my reality. Um, because they can't copy catalogues, they've got to do original. It can be a challenge for some people. Um, and you do need to work with those people um, and get them over it to a point where they actually enjoy cataloging um, those difficult things. Display challenges. Th uh, I'm always being asked, oh, can we have a display, you know, um, and I'll say, yes, I'll put that display, it's got print material in it, so therefore we'll only have it up there uh, in that particular location because you've got so much light, I'm only going to let it up there for a month, and I'll go, yeah, but we want it here permanently, I'm sorry, I'll put a copy of it up there for you, but I'm not going to put the original up there, um, because it is going to get destroyed over time. Um, security. When I first went into archives, it's like everybody had access to archives. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody thought they owned it as well. If anybody belongs, I don't know how it is in this part of the world, but in my part of the world, if you happen to be a church member yeah. and there is archives, then we own it. Mm -hmm. So we have a right to uh, take it, use it as we please, uh, I am constantly having a bit of a battle with that one. I'm slowly, I think, winning on that one. Um, I will give them a copy of something that I'm sorry, this is a one-off item. Uh, how do you expect me to replace it? And they go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Um, a predecessor to me used to lend stuff. We do not lend anything. We, in fact, if the item has to go out of our heritage centre, one of our staff actually goes with it. Um, and that's the only way we've been able to try and safeguard our collection. And also, everything is locked up. Apart from the room being locked, we actually lock up everything within the room as well. So that those people who do have master keys to the building, they can get in, but they can't actually get to the collection. Uh, and you may want to consider that. Um, it's like as soon as they learn that you've got something that, oh, that would be nice to have, um, you can expect that somebody's going to... And I've heard of collections in our part of the world. Uh, items that, I don't know how you put a monetary value on them, but um, they've been lost because somebody else thought they were more valuable than the institution actually keeping them. For storage, um, sh metal shelving is fine. Wood, MDF, plastic, try and get away from it. Boxes, acid-free, polypropylene, get away from plastic and foam. <coughs> Sleeves, go for archival quality. And rolls, if you can afford it, buy archival quality rolls for rolling things on, uh, like mats and so forth. If you can't, then look to do what we did, which is wrap whatever the roll is uh, in mylar uh, and then put the item on the outside of that. I've already talked about mould. Um, please, if you are cleaning up mould, always wear a mask. Um, over time, mould can be quite detrimental to lungs. So please wear a mask if you're ever cleaning up. We wear masks and gloves and we're fully clothed as well when we're doing any of that sort of thing. Um, vermin I've talked about. 
water and moisture. We've found that we've had to put a dehumidifier in um, specifically for the unit, and we actually have a um, a little device that we monitor that monitors that humidity and temperature, uh, and we are constantly checking that and adjusting it as need be. Light, again, I've talked about that. Um, We've actually on our windows put uh, fire retardant block out curtains. We happen to be facing the, uh, what is the afternoon sun. Whoever designed the building didn't think about archives. Uh, and all the windows are on the, get all the afternoon sun. So we basically got to close our windows, our blinds up every afternoon. It here says, um, little tip here, um, the safe adhesives can be cornstarch or wheat starch. Uh, try and use archival approved tapes. For sticky residues, we actually use talcum powder um, to get rid of that sticky, um, and you just put it on with a brush, brush it off again, uh, and that will be that can work quite well. So don't use, and please do not laminate anything. Oh, <laughs> people do it. Uh, and destroy the item um, and super glue is another one um, and sticky albums remember the sticky albums that used to come out yeah. you know look as soon as you get them pull them apart what we do is we actually scan or photograph them then we pull them apart but the back of the photos will all be sticky and a, and a really good way to get them out is get a piece of fishing line put two metal, like metal hooks on the end of it and that thin piece of fishing line will allow you to go in behind the photo and actually pull it through gently and you can lift the photo. Don't grab the photo by the corner and lift it up because you'll crack all the uh, emulsion on the photo. So that's, a, that's an easy way of getting your photos out. Um, there'll be companies wherever you are that handle that sort of thing. Um, Staples, try and, uh, if you have to have them, replace them with archival standard ones. Um, avoid any metal whatsoever. Um, I'm not going to go into cataloging. We use, um, we've built our own database for it and designed it specifically. We have our own thesaurus uh, as well. Um, main thing is to include as much detail as you can. And that's more detail than a library normally puts in. Um, you need, I found I need to be able to search on specific things down the track. Um, display challenges, you've got so many ways you can display things now. Security, please make sure everything, particularly your objects, um, and this was a challenge to me when I first, you know, discovered I had several thousand objects and nothing's been ever catalogued or listed or anything. And I said, well, you know, do I start with number one on the first object and keep going? And uh, the way to do it is you put the year first, then the number. That means you start at one every year. So you don't end up with one million objects. You end up with say 2014 and you might only have received 600 items in that year, so you only go up to that number. 2015, you start at number one again. And it's a really good way of knowing when you've received an item uh, down the track as well. So a number of useful print resources out there. And this is, um, this I wrote this for Australia, but there's a number of preservation supplies out there. Other sources are institutions as well. Um, now, another question, something that came up, and I just want to address, somebody said they had a rolled up photo, big long photo rolled up, didn't know what to do. What we found is a really cheap way, and I'm going over time here, um, is we bought a very large um, plastic drum with wheels, with wheels on it. Okay, so it was about this size. We then bought another drum slightly smaller than that. Now the big, the big one has a lid on it, but the smaller one doesn't. So what you do is you put the smaller one inside the big one. You put 
just a small amount of water in the very bottom of the big drum. Drop your smaller drum into the inside of it and then put your object inside of that. That way you can actually put moisture very slowly back into an item. We've undone, I received uh, probably 300 plans, all had been rolled for a long time. Uh, we put those in there, just got enough moisture back into them to actually allow them to unroll um, safely and then we took them out of it. With photos, uh, you can do parchment as well. I've always even done negative film the same way. Uh, do not put hot water in it to speed it up. It will happen too fast. Uh, what we do is we, with uh, say negative film, we'll actually peg it so it, it hangs. Uh, and so as the moisture comes into the item, you'll actually see it slowly unravel. And it will never touch water. We then, we never leave anything overnight. So we only do the processing during the day and we clean the drum every night. And it may take several days to get some things, to get enough moisture into them to actually unroll them and get them flat. Uh, once, we, once we have got the moisture into them, we actually sit them out in a room uh, with weights on it to allow, if there's too much moisture in there, it will disappear um, and basically to bring it back to what is the normal environment and then we will look at housing it. Um, and we've done that with a huge amount of photos, plans, documents, whatever. Um, and uh, that's a really cheap solution. Otherwise you're going to have to spend I don't know, in our country it's probably about forty, fifty thousand dollars for a dehumidifier. Um, that's a cheap alternative. There's always cheap alternatives to everything. I've gone over time. Thank you for listening. <laughs>